Um, thank you very much everyone for joining us this afternoon and a big thank you to the PNG Australia partnership uh, between our, our secondary schools between Australia and Papua New Guinea. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to be part of this project and to reach out to a new audience and interact and engage with you in this way. My name is Leah and I'm an educator at the National Gallery of Victoria in uh, Australia in the southeast of the country and I'll show you where we are for those of you who are not familiar with Melbourne or the gallery that I work at. And we are here today to launch a project relating to an exhibition at the National Gallery of Victoria or the NGV called We Change the World. I'd like to just say a big hello and thank you to Nicole and Sophie. I've been working very closely with the two of them to put this project together. It's been wonderful working with you both along the way and it's excellent to have you here for the project launch. A uh, big shout out to, I know we've got Aaron and Junior who are doing some support on either side as well. And I'm also uh, very pleased to welcome Anna if she's in the space as well. And also we've got our friends um, joining us from the PNG National Museum and Art Gallery as well. And I will um, introduce the staff uh, as I hand over to them to lead you through a look at uh, some of the artworks on display in their gallery and museum collection as well. Now I'd like to just familiarise you with where we are, where I am here today at the National Gallery of Victoria and take a moment to acknowledge both geographical Australia. A lot of you are quite familiar, I would imagine, with the country Australia and what it looks like, a big uh, island continent nation surrounded by, by water. Uh, some of the schools who are joining today, of course, come from different parts of Australia and uh, some of our other friends joining us are coming from a little further afield across Papua New, New Guinea. This map here might be a little less familiar to some. This map shows the country of Australia, but we also can see many different coloured areas across the country that represent all of the Aboriginal, the Indigenous Australian, cultural and language groups. These are all individual Aboriginal communities that have their own language, customs, traditions and ways of making art. And where we are located, down here, here is Victoria in Melbourne. I'd like to acknowledge that this building where I am today is built on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people the Indigenous people and traditional custodians of this land. And I wish to extend an acknowledgement to all of the traditional owners of the land upon which your homes and your schools and your offices are built wherever you are today as well. So throughout the session, you'll see and you'll hear me refer to the NGV, which stands for the National Gallery of Victoria. So as I mentioned, Victoria is the state and Melbourne is the capital city. And when you come and visit us, you'll be able to visit two of our galleries. We have an NGV International Building. That's where I am today. I'm actually sitting in our education lecture theatre. So if you visit with a school group, you might have a lecture in this space before exploring the museum. And in this particular building, this is where we house our artworks and design pieces that the gallery has collected from all over the world. We also have another uh, gallery site called NGV Australia, named after Ian Potter, uh, someone who's worked very closely to support the arts in uh, Victoria and across Australia. And it's at this building that you will be able to see um, artworks made by Aboriginal Australians artists who were born in Australia and also artists who were born elsewhere but came to Australia to live and create their art. And this is where the two buildings are located. So they're very close to each other right in the heart of the city. So if you haven't had a chance to visit us yet, we'd love to see you. We're open almost every day of the year, 
every day except Christmas Day. And so much of what we have to showcase is available for you to explore for free. We've also got some great online uh, content that you can explore at home or at school. So if you're quite inspired and would like to learn more, there are lots of ways to discover what's going on at NGV through some of our online platforms and online exhibitions. And we're here to talk about a particular exhibition and it has to do with this idea of change. So our project that we are working towards together, the project we're launching today is called We Change the World. And at the core of this exhibition are statements like this, art and design can change the world. And I would love to know what you think our audience, teachers and students and visitors to this you know, platform, what do you think? Do you think art and design can change the world? Now, we were going to try and run a little bit of a poll here, Nicole. So I'm um, just wondering if that is going to work. Oh, excellent. Great. I can see that you've started a poll. I can already see Jodie on the chat. You're saying absolutely. That's a very strong yes. Oh, yes, I can see um, Chitra, you're saying yes as well. Now, while I'm sharing my screen, I'm just waiting to see if I can get that poll to pop up myself. Let's see. Nicole, I'm wondering if you can see any of the poll responses coming through yet. Yeah, I can see um, all yes at this stage. Oh, wow. That is uh, really promising and really inspiring. I'm, I'm glad we've started off on uh, this particular foot. I'm curious to see where we can, you know, take this idea that art and design can change the world. All right. I'd like to ask you another question. And this is a sentence that you can finish in the chat. I think change is... How would you finish that sentence? You can use one word, you can use a few words. Kanchan, you've said that I think change is better. Kiara, I think change is making a positive difference. And Jodie, change is finding new perspectives. I'm wondering, do any of you have students with you in the classroom at the moment? Change is for better. No students today. I was going to say if you need to have a little bit of a conversation with uh, the group, if you do have your students with you, take some time to have a conversation with them now. These can also be conversation starters that you have uh, when you're next together working on the project or just checking in with one another. Okay, so my next question, this is a little more complex. I would like to know what is a change that you would like to see and why? And if you've just joined us, I could see someone just entered the space. If you've just joined us, we've just been thinking about the idea of art and design having the power to change the world, people, society. And I would love to know what is a change that you would like to see and why is that change important to you? Oh, Kiara, this is great. I hope you don't mind. I'm just gonna read this out. The change we would like to see is breaking the bias and double standards between men and women. Absolutely. There are definitely some artists and designers in the exhibition We Change the World who are very passionate about gender equality and fighting for the rights of, of women in areas of society that are still heavily dominated by men or where favour is uh, swaying towards uh, men and uh, I think when you peruse the exhibition content 
um, and you think about some of the comments that artists and designers are making, I think it will, you know, potentially inform you that things are changing, but change can be slow. It can take time. It can take a lot of reinforcement. Oh, I can see, Titra, you're saying more women in art and design to change the world. Oh, yes, it's like you've seen some of the work in the exhibition already. And Kanchan, people should intermingle more and enjoy life at the most. Yes. Even just looking at things in a more positive way and having compassion for others and caring for others making the most of an opportunity can be a very small change that you can make in your immediate life, your workplace, in your classroom. And Richard, you've added to the conversation living in a more sustainable and economical society. And Jody, more people in our world choosing to be accepting of others regardless of gender, ethnicity or beliefs. Great, so you're touching on some really big issues there, social issues, economic issues, big issues that artists and designers have been tackling in their work for quite some time through a number of different uh, mediums, different materials and approaches and around the world. And my last question for you, and thank you for being so forthcoming with your responses. These are really big questions. Uh, it's, you know, the afternoon. Um, I'm asking a lot of you to answer these questions on the spot, um, but I'd love to see, I'd love to hear coming through the chat, how do you think you can be a change maker and help this change happen? So the change you wanna see in the world, how can you be a change maker and help make that happen? So Chitran, you've said that more women need to participate in decision making. Yeah, that's really interesting. I wonder if there's something that you can do in your life, in your context, in your workplace, classroom, in your community, where you can help make that happen. Oh, great. Jodie, very um, reaffirming message through your everyday experiences within the classroom, keeping your students positive and open-minded by positively influencing the world around us. You've added there, Kiara, beautiful flow on from that comment from Jodie. Initiate the social activities of common interests which bring people together, Kanchan. Yes, yeah, so really focusing on community these are all really great responses and uh, demonstrate that this has been a really positive um, way to start the session. Um, and I'm really keen to hear what you have to say about some of the works that we are going to look at today. So at this point, I'd like to introduce the exhibition called We Change the World currently on display at the National Gallery of Victoria. It's located at the NGV Australia site, though it does contain works of art and design from all over the world. And the common thread that the works in this exhibition have is that the artists and the designers who created them have done so to attempt to positively affect society in a way that means we as a community, as a, a culture, as a city, as a nation, um, as a globe can progress towards a more positive future. It's a really great exhibition to explore with students because it asks them to think about the very same questions that I was just asking you. How art and design can make a change in the world? What are some changes that you would like to see and how can you be a change maker and bring about this particular change? So artists and designers featured in this exhibition have got something to say about either the environment, 
a social or political issue, something to do with our future. Sustainability came up in the chat already and how we can harness our collective knowledge to work together to make the, make the world a better place for ourselves and for future generations as well. Oh, I can just see there's another comment coming through um, from uh, Chitra. You said that uh, you've been thinking about women making decisions and being given the opportunity to sit in positions to do that. And you can start by providing more opportunities for female students in the classroom to participate in decision making and participation. I just want to take a moment to say that I think teachers are so valuable and precious and important to the ideas that are at the centre of this exhibition. And you actually have such a huge, you know, role without sounding like it's a lot of pressure. You have this wonderful opportunity to work with and influence and help the young people who are working with you during their time at school in the classroom to help consider where we are, what we want to change and how we can do it. Artists and designers are in a unique position um, as our teachers, you, like artists in a gallery, have a voice in the classroom and you can help influence change by encouraging and motivating uh, the students in your classroom. And uh, when we get to the part of this project where we talk about how you can actually make some work of, of art and design with the students in your class, um, I think there'll be some great opportunity for discussion and where you can all get together to really think about what's important to us, what do we want to see change and how can we demonstrate that and actually help it to come about? Now, there's a lot in this exhibition and we don't have time today to talk about absolutely everything, but I would like to show you where you can find exhibition content online and a couple of different ways of exploring that with your students. So going to jump over to this location here and hopefully you can still see my screen. Here we are on the National Gallery of Victoria website. This is an intro page to the exhibition, We Change the World. I think it's really interesting that the exhibition is titled, We Change the World, and not Art and Design Can Change the World, or not Artists and Designers Change the World. Uh, a lot of you have spoken in the chat about empowering your students and putting the community at the center of change. So there's this idea in the exhibition that we all together collectively and individually have the ability to make a positive change. So this exhibition space is very easily accessible online. Um, we've got, uh, you can go through the NGV website. Oh, I can just see, wonderful. Uh, thank you, that might be Aaron. Thank you for dropping that into the chat there. Um, so we'll also be sharing a lot of links with you via your Google Classroom throughout the um, project as well. So when you land on this particular page, you can have a read about the ideas embedded in the exhibition. There are lots of great videos, essays, a lot of great reflection. I won't show you this one today, but do have a look at Young Voices on Change. This is a video in which young Australian students uh, experience the exhibition and they share their thoughts on the power of art and design and how it can change the world. But the thing I'd like to show you today is this virtual tour. This is a great way to experience the exhibition if you can't make it into the gallery. So regardless of where you're sitting right now, we are sitting in a virtual exhibition or gallery space, the entrance of the exhibition, we change the world. And uh, there were a lot of really difficult things about 2020 and 2021. And we've all had to go through this terrible global pandemic that made things painful and difficult. And we've experienced a lot of tragedy and loss but I have to say one of the silver linings has been the ability to connect with people online and the ability to visit a lot of art galleries and museums and public spaces that we would not normally have the chance to see. 
so even though a lot of us are very far away from Melbourne, Australia, we can actually enjoy this exhibition uh, together virtually. And please take the time to explore it with your students. Now I'm just panning over this work here because this is one that I wanted to stop and show you because it's very impressive, if not for its scale, then for its detail. And one of the things I love about the virtual tours that you can take is just how close you can get to the artwork and just how much of that detail you can see. We can get closer in virtual space than you can in real life. I'm not sure if this has ever happened to you. I, I doubt the wonderful people at the PNG National Museum and Gallery have this problem, but if you get too close to an artwork, a security guard will normally ask you to take a step back. But our virtual tour space allows us to get very close to some of these artworks. So can I just ask, as I pan around this image, what do you think we are looking at? It is beautiful, isn't it? It is something so beautiful. Jodie, you're adding that it's a landscape. Natural, yep. And can you see how it has been made? Yeah, natural wool. Yes, it has been made with wool. A number of different uh, carpet making and carpet weaving techniques have gone into creating the different natural uh, textures that one would commonly encounter in this particular environment. I'm gonna just jump back into the PowerPoint because it's actually quite nice to to get a few images of the piece um, as well with, with um, people in front of it, just to show you the scale. So what we've um, just been looking at is an interpretation of the Santa Cruz River created by artist Alexandra Kehiogalu. Now, Alexandra Kehiogalu currently lives in Argentina and this uh, particular, I'm gonna call it a portrait of a landscape uh, this portrait of this landscape was made in 2017. The Santa Cruz River runs through the bottom of Argentina. It is a vital water source supplying water to uh, the local um, flora as well as several species of animals. Um, there are also these beautiful uh, big sort of um, glacier ice fields that attract tourists um, who want to, you know, experience the, the majesty of the environment. And uh, Alexandra Kihioglu worked with a number of people to research this particular environment. I'm just going to pop this particular um, picture up here uh, because it's a huge piece. Um, it's overwhelmingly big. It's over seven um, metres long when it's installed. Um, we can see here that there are a number of dimensions. Uh, that's because it can be installed on a slope. In fact, um, prior to the pandemic, instead of being hung on the wall, it was actually installed in the gallery on a slope so people could sit on the landscape. They could lie on this landscape and they could feel all of the different textures of the environment. Um, and uh, Alexandra Kehioglu made this particular piece of work drawing upon her family's tradition of carpet making. So she's using, um, I guess, techniques and materials that are really known to her and her family and her background. She made this particular carpet uh, because the Santa Cruz River was going to be quite terribly affected by the construction of two hydroelectric dams um, that were the result of a deal being struck between the Argentinian and Chinese governments. Um, of course, we need power. Um, we all use power, we depend on it. 
every day. We know our population is, is you know, increasing, the demand for power, running water and so on is increasing and um, hydroelectricity was um, an option um, that these governments saw. So this particular part of the Santa Cruz uh, River um, has been flooded since uh, with the construction of the dams. But originally, uh, Alexandra Kehioglu, a team of scientists, activists, environmentalists, they travelled this section of the river, they canoed up and down it, they camped along it, they really got involved to get to know the area and she produced this work as, uh, I guess, a way of sharing with the world how beautiful this landscape is and how fragile it is. Uh, and it was her way of, I guess, maybe she knew that maybe there was no way of saving this particular part of the river, but by using the Santa Cruz River and the story of the hydroelectric dams, perhaps she could raise the awareness of the fragility of our environment and how human impact is affecting um, that environment and the long-term consequences of that too. So I'll show you a couple of the, um, the close-ups as well. I can see that some of you have made a few comments about the texture. Um, I'm just wondering, what are your ideas uh, about this piece of work being a rug, being something made of wool? Why do you think she chose to use wool I mean, I've mentioned that her family background um, is heavily, well, she comes from a family of carpet makers, so her background is, is influencing her. But why a carpet? Why use wool? Thinking about like materials and the power of material in artwork, do you see any other advantages to using wool and creating a carpet rather than just taking a photo or painting a picture. Kanchan, you're mentioning that it's longer lasting. Yeah, it's in very good condition, I have to say. Um, you can just take this down and roll it up like um, any carpet. It takes a lot of room to store it. I certainly couldn't fit it in my house. Yeah, the texture and the topography, there's more detail that um, Alexandra Kehioglu might be able to capture a natural resource you're adding, Jody. The carpet is something that people are able to engage with. That's right. Yeah. Uh, just like she spent a week canoeing and camping along the river, people who are experiencing this rug were originally invited to get really close to it, get right down on it and experience it and feel it. Um, sometimes a picture that we see there's still a distance between the viewer and that photograph or that painting or that drawing. Um, but in Alexandra Kehioglu's case, she wanted to create something that she felt could communicate the beauty of the detail in the environment, but also could allow people to get closer to it, you know, be a bit of a child, lie on it, roll around on it, you know, stretch your arms over it, actually feel the textures of the environment and suddenly that environment becomes very close. So even though this river is in Argentina, I'm joining you today from Melbourne, you're across Australia, Papua New Guinea, we all have experiences of our own natural places like this. Yeah, to create different layers and the depth of the creation. Exactly. I think so too, Kiara. The scale is large, but also the detail really creates a sense of, I guess, the, the importance and significance of this environment. So this is one example of how an artist, a group of artists, she was heavily supported and helped in this process, um, can use their power and their voice as a creator to instigate change. Now, the dams were built, the river was flooded, but has the story ended there? Do you think this work still has the ability to influence change in the future, even though the specific dams that inspired the rug were built and the landscape was changed forever? Do you think there's still some value to this statement? Do you think this work of art can still influence change? I know it makes me um, reflect on my own relationship with the environment and the way that I use water. 
And if this is the kind of discussion that you can have um, with your students, then, you know, that, that continual persistence, that determination for change can continue. Yes, Jodie, you're saying it's a reminder of something that we've lost. Yeah. Um, it allows room for personal interpretation, expression and growth. And it highlights the beauty and existence of nature in our life. Wonderful. If Alexandra Kehioglu was in the room and could read all of these amazing comments, I think she would be very happy. Okay, uh, again, I'm going to open with the same question. What is this? What are we looking at here? You may have seen this before. You might be able to interpret what it is or how it's used. A flag, yep. Flags are interesting, aren't they? They are very simple uh, symbols. When I say simple, like graphically, they're paired back, reduced to a series of colors and shapes that represent something. Refugee uh, flag used in the Olympics this year. Yeah. Well, interestingly, uh, yes, it is a flag for the refugee nation who appeared in the Olympic Games in 2016. And it was designed uh, by a woman named Yara Saeed, a refugee herself. We were thinking about, well, I was just talking about colours and shapes and how they are so simple and how they are basically kind of boiled down to their very essence to go onto a flag. Like a, we're talking about the opposite, you know, this is full of so much detail and now we're looking at a piece of design, a flag, which needs to be seen from afar and represent something, someone, a group of people in this case. Uh, what do you think these colours um, might mean? Thinking about like the, the colours and symbols on, you know, flags that you're used to seeing, they've all got stories and meanings. But what about this flag? Oh, Kiara, you're so quick on them. Yeah, and you're right on the money there too, representing a life jacket. Yes, yeah, so uh, Yara Saeed uh, took the very powerful and instantly recognisable colours of a life jacket worn by so many um, people seeking refuge across the seas, the life jackets that are uh, abandoned upon you know, reaching the shore and interpret the, those colours to create this flag. So the people who competed uh, in the Olympics for the refugee nation no longer had a place to call home because they had fled it and they had left it behind. So this flag was, um, I guess, meant to kind of unify them and demonstrate that unity. So they had a flag, they had a symbol, they had colours to fly. Uh, when they marched into the Olympic Stadium in 2016. Um, someone asked, it was Jody, uh, was this used in the Olympics this year? You know what, I was keeping a really uh, close watch for it um, during the Tokyo Olympic um, opening ceremony last year. And I think they were actually competing together under um, an International Olympic Committee banner. So I didn't see this particular flag and I'm not sure why they didn't fly it again. Um, I would have liked to have, you know, just to see it because I've learned about it um, since. Um, but, you know, flags, this idea of um, something as simple as a few colours and shapes uh, being able to inspire change. Um, thinking about maybe the, the flags in your life, your national flag, or you might have colours uh, that, that you respond to. You know, you might be in a team. You might have a cultural flag that you fly. Can you share some of the stories about the flags in your life. Can you tell me about the colors and the symbols and what they represent? Yeah, Richard, you're talking about, you know, colors um, representing solidarity and togetherness, absolutely. And in the case of the refugee uh, nation, all of the people competing in the Olympics in that team have all worn these colors when they were seeking refuge and leaving their countries behind. Yep, 
nothing says solidarity and togetherness like that, I think. Being wrapped in that that lifeguard or that life vest and having those colours flying above you. Um, it's kind of interesting, actually, now that I think about it, the way that the orange and the black, you know, were perhaps once colours that were quite, you know, carried a lot of negativity and, you know, maybe trauma and pain and suffering, but to, you know, stand underneath that flag, you know, with pride, we have survived, we are, we are the refugee nation and we, we are here. That must have been a very empowering experience. Who we are and our community are just adding there as well, Kiara. Yeah, that's great. And we're going to move into, um, you know, in a little bit, uh, we're going to think about the way your students can make their own um, statements about what they would like to do and the change that they would like to make. And using things that are very simple, like just colours or just shapes, or in this case, mostly words, um, to communicate an idea is uh, something that sometimes is, is, is maybe overlooked in favour for a lot of, you know, colour and detail. But uh, we're going to get into a project after today where this, your students are invited to make posters for change and really try to spread, you know, that passion that they have for the change that they want to see in the world and moving from the simplicity but also the power of the flag to the simplicity but the power of these words. Uh, we're looking at some posters by a group of artists called the Gorilla Girls who were very active in the United States. They appeared in the 80s. Some of you may have heard of them before. Um, they're called the Gorilla Girls and they wear gorilla masks um, and no one knows who they are are underneath these gorilla masks. Um, they adopted the gorilla after someone misspelt their name in, a, in a, a media post, like in the newspaper back in the 80s. So they adopted like the identity of the gorilla as these gorilla, you know, um, women are working in secrecy and they were fighting um, sexism and gender inequality that they saw happening, particularly in the arts. And I'm really glad I included this poster now, not just because it's very powerful and very, you know, simple in its design, but because um, it, the gender inequality and sexism and, and fairness has come up in the conversation today. So these are actually two posters uh, that they made. Um, we can see here they're um, 30 years apart. Um, the Gorilla Girls were really uh, looking closely in the 1980s <clears throat> at women and also people of colour being represented in museums and galleries in um, New York. And in 1985, there were how many one-person exhibitions uh, featuring the work of women? There were zero at the Guggenheim Museum, zero at the Metropolitan, zero, uh, only one at the Modern Art Gallery and zero at the Whitney. Um, so they used these really um, powerful, simple, bold statements. They produced their work themselves. They screen printed their posters. It was really cheap. They were making or kind of mixing, you know, high art, high end art with, you know, low, um, low production, um, low cost printing techniques um, to produce these posters that appeared around the street. So their message is quite widespread. And then 30 years later, they revisited those questions to ask, all right, so how many women are having one person shows? Now, 2015, Thinking about change and how powerful art and design can be, we can see that those numbers have gone up just a little bit. So when we're thinking about poster design, um, what makes these posters powerful? What stands out to you? What are the visual elements here? What makes these power, powerful posters effective, eye-catching? The colour and the big numbers, absolutely. How would you describe the, the font colour, Kanchan? Contrasting. Contrasting colours, yep. It's interesting, um, when I've been in the exhibition with students, these two posters they often look at very closely uh, and yeah, it's it's because of things like the bright contrasting colours, 
Oh, that's really interesting. We've got the, the slogans, Bettina. Thank you for contributing that. And Kanchan, you're adding the official information. Yeah, it looks very legit. Statistics, numbers don't lie. The background of the posters. It's interesting, isn't it, that in 1985, the poster was white with black text and now in 2015, it's flipped around. So posters for change can be very simple. Um, they can also be very illustrative and very detailed. But as you explore the project with your students and you come up with ideas for what they'd like to change and how their posters can reflect it, um, starting with some ideas like this, pairing it back, keeping it simple, um, what's going to grab people's attention? What are they going to see immediately? These posters might be a way of starting. The final work I wanted to um, touch on just briefly um, was a work that comes from a section in the exhibition um, that really brings it back to um, celebrating every day, looking at you know, what is immediately in your life in front of you and uh, giving it some time. Um, so the things that we use every day that maybe we overlook, the power that we have to make change that we forget that we have ourselves bringing it back to your everyday life and starting there to make change. And um, it was actually Nicole who mentioned that a lot of you recently um, were involved in a photo friendship um, program or project where you had to film a second of your daily life and put it all together. And there is a section in the exhibition um, that features works like this, David Hockney, a very you know, well-known painter who picked up an iPad in his early 80s and, and learned how to you know, paint digitally after painting with oil paints for most of his life, painting everyday scenes, kind of elevating what it is that we have just in front of us, those little one second snippets of your life and putting them together and elevating them and bringing them up, reminding us that there are big issues out there. There are big things we would like to change, but it can all start with us in our homes and in our lives in a very simple and small way. So I think I'm going to uh, wrap it up there. Thank you very much. And I'm really excited um, now to look at even more art. And I'm, I'm just going to sit back and uh, really soak it all in. I am very excited to be uh, handing over, here we go, wonderful, to the uh, PNG National Museum and Art Gallery. Um, I can see Loretta, you're actually in the gallery there. I can see Junior is in a gallery space as well. Um, so you are going to take us through, Loretta, some of the artworks that are on display there so we can kind of couple an experience of the NGV's work with what's happening in PNG. So Loretta, I'm absolutely delighted to hand over to you, Manager of Access, Education and Public Programs. Um, I'm really looking forward to exploring uh, elements of your gallery and seeing some of the work on display there. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Yes, welcome. And um, I think you've got some of your colleagues there in the space too. So I'd like to also thank uh, Patricia, Mark, Amaru, if you're in the spaces as well, thank you for getting your team together. And Dr. Andrew, Andrew Motu as well, who is the director. Yes. Thank you so Cora. much for joining us. We're very honored to have you all here and we're looking forward to having a look at your collection. Okay. Hello everyone. Hello online viewers. My name is Loretta from the PNG National Museum and Art Gallery. So I will bring to you four objects with the aid of my colleagues. Uh, they will introduce each of the objects to you and in the hope that we will try to stimulate discussions and ideas behind how art can change the world through the stories of each of these objects. So up first is Hamaru. So we'll be talking about Kasawari. Although not contemporary in nature, its significance brings to us the link between PNG and Australia, dating back to the last glacial period when the two countries was part of one land, the Sahul land. Hi, Hamaru. Hi. Can you tell us a bit about the Kasawari? Okay, um, 
Takasor is on display in our gallery. Um, in PNG, we have three species, um, but I'm, I'll be focusing on only one, and that is the Southern Cassowary, as you can see, just at the back of me. Okay, I will basically talk about, just talk a bit about its um, characteristics and physical appearance, and then go on to some values and then just sum it up. Okay, firstly, about the physical appearance, um, the cassowary is, or well, the southern cassowary is common in Papua New Guinea and also in Australia. Um, it shares some distinct features and physical appearance. Um, it is called a double veto cassowary because of the red petals that hang just under its throat. And um, it is believed that once they reach maturity, they, um, they grow petals and it has a color or substance that is red. And um, you will find that it doesn't have feathers on its neck, throat, or the head. Uh, feather down to the lower part of the body. Um, the, 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 there is a distinct feature at its feet. Uh, the feet comprise of three toes um, on both sides. Um, it, it is a decal like um, toe that is used to. Um, run at the high speed um, and as you can see right at the top of the cassowary's head is, um, it's called a cast or um, a horn that she or he uses to run um, at the high speed tearing vegetation and anything that comes in its way. Okay, the characteristics of a cassowary is solitary and territorial in Aboriginal meat or beliefs, it is um, something that they promote uh, or see as a symbol of protection. And um, they believe that once it is provoked, it sold into violence and thus protects its territory and whatever that consists of its territory. Um, in PNG context, um, the cassowary has so many symbolic or customary symbols of beliefs, traditional beliefs. Um, when you find the time to come over and visit the National Museum and Aquality, you will find that the cassowary has a lot of attachment to these different objects. Um, certain objects have their certain descriptions and captions that tell a story about a uh, bridal ceremony, a warrior, um, probably a big man in a clan, and so forth. So the cassowary is attached with more cultural um, values, traditions, and also customs. Um, it is believed that a cassowary, um, its way of lifestyle, the female tends to carry out more responsibility. The female tends to carry out more responsibility than the female. Um, the female um, just lays off the offsprings. And she goes on to the next male to um, male to continue the reproductive process. Okay, there are two factors that are affecting the cassowary today. One is urbanization, and the other one is global warming. Um, urbanization, in a sense, where the cassowaries are forest dwellers, or many might say gardeners, because they tend to disperse seeds. And they create space for new seedlings to um, grow. And from there, they believe that once the trees grow, it creates um, produces food for them to survive on. But because urbanization has taken over, no clearing of forests, um, logging has caused um, issues for the reproduction of cassowaries. That is why they are at the threat. Um, also, with um, global warming, um, Cassowaries tend to live at a certain temperature, but once the uh, temperature is hotter, they adapt to a moderate level, but once the place is too hot, it causes them to um, die or get weak, and might as well, most of the populations are affected by it. So um, my 
my presentation or from um, talking about the Cascoris, how can we change the world through the time of the Cascori? Um, I've already spoken that they are balanced in um, uh, caring responsibilities and also they tend to preserve and conserve um, not only the environment they live in, but also for their offsprings. Thank you. Thank you, Hamaru. What a wonderful bird it is. Only found within our world, but at risk of extinction. How can we change the world for our cassowary and also for us, the inhabitants of the two worlds that the cassowary lives on? Let us now head over to Mark, and Mark will introduce us to a Bilum. Hi, everyone, and online viewers. I'm Mark. And I'll be talking to you about the bilum. The bilum or string bag is made from natural fibers extracted from tree bugs and vines twisted and woven together by women and is a skill passed by women to women over generations. Although made by women, it can be carried by both men and women, with slight differences in shape, style, and color. A gathering of items needed to make a bilum can be done by either men or women. So what can this bilum tell us about gender? As you take a look at this bilum here, It has two sides. On the side facing down, it is plain, this side, with no decorations. Whilst from the side facing up, that way, it is decorated with cassowary's feathers woven on. Looking at the side facing up, it is considered masculine because only strong men hunts down a cassowary and even truly collects feathers from it. And similarly, cassowary symbolizes power, strength, status, and leadership from the societies where the billow is originated from. Presumably, the owner of this billow is a man. Already we are stereotyping strong physical characteristics to be of men, hence limiting the capacity of women to develop their personal abilities. Let me end by reiterating that how can we change the world when we continue to stereotype and promote one gender over the other. Wonderful. Traditionally made by women, but intentionally made for men, it teaches us a lot about gender stereotyping. And when we promote one gender over the, the other, we are giving power to one gender and making it superior than the other. Let us now head over to Patricia, who will introdu introduce us to a painting. Hello, everyone. This is a contemporary artwork. Um, it's a painting by Jean Mara, who hails from Koma area of Ambunti in the East Pacific province. The art depicts a spider which has its web web trap. Locally amongst the Koma, the spider web trap is associated with the mysteries of luck and fortune, with the intricacies of bloom weaving connected with feminine creativity and the masculine sphere of game hunting. Compared to an ant, which lives in colonies bustling with activities, 
A spider is a solitary anthropod whose techniques of survival is acquired out individually. The solitary activities of spider is similar to the manner in which artists are able to extend and indiv individuate the creativity of the cultures. Unlike ants that work in colonies and collectively in groups to build their nests, a spider works in solitary, in, in complete solitary and in isolation to create its webs and catch its prey. Within, with its ability to sustain itself, the spider uses the silk from its body to create the spiraling, spiraling and silky network of a web designed to trap its prey only within the capacity of the spider. The spider does not catch its prey, but uses the web to catch the spider's prey. Interestingly, spiders are natural controllers of pests and insects, serving a significant role in keeping population of pests and insects in check. Without them, our world would be overrun by other insects. A lesson we can get from spiders is that, at times, if we want to change the world, we will need to work alone and within our means, just like the spider who dwells within the means of its web. Let us now head over to Dr. Motu, who will give us an insight into another object, which is called a lintel. Good afternoon, um, I'm Andrew. Um, I want to tell you a story about this particular piece of uh, tub lintel um, that was made in uh, 1983 by a group of artists to decorate uh, the facade, uh, the bottom part of the facade to the entrance of the National Parliament. Um, in 2013, uh, it was cut and removed um, under a, a puritanist religious idea to reform and modernize the parliament. Uh, and um, it was removed from parliament and the museum uh, considered that it was an act of sacrilege and that it uh, uh, what was um, what was done was an act of um, um, an act of sacrilege, deconsecrated uh, what happened uh, in the story of the parliament. Anyway, but this is a lintel. A lintel is a horizontal beam that runs across um, a wall, supports a window or a wall in a house or a building. And they, in our national parliament, it uh, basically set at the basement of the facade and adorned the entrance into the parliament. Uh, unfortunately, it was removed. Uh, we took the matter to court in 2014 and ran the court case for about two years. And uh, uh, eventually, our national court ruled that uh, what was done in removing and destroying this uh, uh, design uh, artwork was both illegal and unconstitutional. Um, so the three pieces that have been uh, destroyed in, or desecrated have been brought here into the museum, and this is one of them, is this piece here, which is on So I think the fact that it was considered a symbol of an ancient, archaic, arcane world of mystery and uh, uh, totemic beliefs, uh, it appeared to be in resistance to ideas of uh, the modern and the progressive. And so it was caught in a story of change. The idea to remove it was to try and inspire a new future of change in, in parliamentary democracy and governance and so on. Uh, uh, despite all the other uh, stories that went on with it, it was caught up in a kind of conflict. It was caught up in a kind of tension that you have to try and balance between uh, what was traditional faith, so beliefs, and what is new and modern. Um, but originally, from where it comes from, the idea is drawn from the Abelam area of the Pacific province. And 
this, this particular kinds of lintels with totemic uh, uh, carvings on them normally grazed uh, the uh, front of uh, uh, men's houses or spirit houses. And in the local language, it, it's called Angualdo. It's called Angualdo, meaning simply meaning that it's it, it's the grandfather man, <laughs> uh, referring to uh, you know uh, a line of epic ancestors that uh, uh, stand for and define the community. So this is a story about the social composition of the men's house. This is represented and identified by the different kinds of totems. So when the artist worked on embellishing the national parliament in 1980s. They carved out 19 images to represent the view that the people from the 19 provinces of Papua New Guinea, at that time, now we've got 21 provinces. Uh, the people from these three provi uh, 21 provinces or 19 provinces are the constituents of this great house assembly. So the point is that the idea of the lintels is that it's talking about the social composition of the house. Just as a village is made up of several hamlets or several clans who are distributed over different area of land, and they come together in different uh, ceremonial or uh, 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 social circumstances, uh, the house is also a kind of gathering where it brings together people. And so just as you find that a clan is made up of several families or a village is made up of several clans and so on, um, numbers two are made up of different numbers. So 21 clans is made up of, you know, uh, uh, 21 provinces are made up of the different kinds of people that make up the province and so on. So some <coughs> the number of, the idea of number and composition is implicit and underlies the idea of this uh, uh, lintel here. And so, how, 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 do you, how, do, how do you want to change the world? Uh, it means that somehow uh, the numbers must be responsible for how we want to address questions of fidelity, integrity, the quality of democracy and so on. So, how, how do you do it? Well, this lintel here is a badge of identity, but if you connect this badge of identity with a number, then maybe that's the time that you begin to affect and change the quality of electoral representation in Papua New Guinea. So, so it's a number, uh, there's it's got to be an integer connected to an algorithm that allows us to, uh, uh, you know, bring in uh, a good and quality uh, turnaround of parliamentary leadership. So we have to invest in, in a kind of national identity card system that allows us to vote uh, with quality and with integrity. Because uh, we find sometimes stories about people voting 10 times because they wipe away the, uh, the ink on their fingers. Or we find that in some electorates, some people haven't voted in uh, with numbers that exceeds the number of uh, 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 eligible voters in their uh, uh, electorates. So all those kinds of stories, I think, uh, what this one points to is that to change the quality of leadership, to change especially in parliamentary leadership, uh, we need a, a connection between art and number, or between identity and integers. And this is the story uh, of, um, of this particular leader. Uh, it's sad to say that it was uh, uh, desacralized by being cut and removed in the place where it comes from, uh, you don't destroy them by cutting and uh, taking them down. You let them uh, live out their full life as an, an ephemeral art form. You leave them in the back uh, uh, somewhere, in the back uh, part of the village somewhere, and they decompose. The belief is that if they decompose, then they provide nourishment for the next garden of yams. So a man is a different kind of yam, and a yam is a different kind of man, and there is a kind of cultural play on analogical reasoning between the yen and a man, or yen, man, and a human being. And what the lintel does is to go in between this permutation of thoughts, how the man appears as a yen and the yen appears as a man. And in, on ceremonial occasions, you'll find men enacting uh, 
the composition of a yam in, in, a, in a dancing uh, uh, spectacle and so on. So the idea of decomposition and composition works to creating a future, creating membership, creating an integrity uh, that could help create the conditions again for planting a new garden and harvesting the future. So this is how we can change the world from the perspective of an identity bed such as the Lincoln. Thank you, Doctor. A very insightful message. I think the message we can get out of the lintel is that if we want to reform the parliament by taking down the lintel, what chains do we want to put back into parliament? And how do we do it? This brings us to the end of um, our presentation on the four objects. I hope that um, it inspires some of us with you know, ideas and, and um, stir up conversations on how, um, especially for students, where they will put out their projects together. And yeah, I think um, that's it from us. And we are looking forward to answer any questions or any queries or, or yeah, anything that um, our viewers have. Please send them through. Thank you very much, Loretta. And I'd also like to also uh, extend that thanks to Patricia, Mark, Pamaru, and Dr. Andrew Motu. I am so inspired by the story of the cassowary, what it represents. I'm moved by the fragility of the environment in which it lives. Um, I'm constantly struck by the, the beauty of traditional practices like those that go into creating a villain created by women, worn by men, <laughs> unifying the gender. Just reinforcing the significance of, you know, everyone in the community, man, um, woman. Um, the amazing work of the the spider. It, the spider is an artist, it ever enduring and uh, working in solidarity, but with such a, a determination. What an inspiration for us as well. And then finally, to reflect on the lintel that I, I put into the chat, there is just so much meaning embedded in that object, and I've never seen anything like that before. Um, so thank you so much for sharing uh, that work and this idea that. Change can be exciting, change and revolution can be inspiring, but that question is what is coming next and really bringing people back together, unifying people as we make that decision. We need something to change. We are ready for change, but we have to be in that change together for it to work. I think that's a really wonderful sentiment. Um, to finish with. So thank you so much. And I just want to say, I'm sure everyone is thinking it as well. Your museum is beautiful. And it was just lovely to see all of those amazing works of art and design, traditional and contemporary, uh, with so many stories embedded um, within them. Um, you've given us so much insight into Papua New Guinean custom culture, tradition and artistic expression. And uh, look at that, across two galleries, different parts of the world, we can have these amazing discussions about art and design and the power to change the world. So thank you very, very much. And Junior, great job managing the technology there as well. Thank you. I certainly hope I get to visit the museum uh, at some stage. Um, I, if it's okay, um, Nicole, I'd like to take a moment to run through what the uh, poster making project is going to be, if you think that's okay. All right, wonderful. Thank you once again to everyone at the PNG National Museum and Art Gallery. It was a delight to have you with us and uh, I am looking forward to exploring more of your collection and learning more about your museum online. Okay, so We've had all of these great ideas and all of this inspiration. What are we gonna do with it all? Where do we go from here? So I would like to just share with you some resources that you will be able to use uh, to embark on your own creative project with your students. So reflecting on what we have done today, uh, we have set up a little web page for you to visit 
to help you learn more about the exhibition, We Change the World, to help you learn more about uh, the National Gallery of Victoria and who we are and what we're doing and why we're working um, with the wonderful um, PAWS, the past group today. Um, and also where you can find the instructions on how to create your poster and how to share it with us. So I think this link has just been shared with you in the chat and I think um, Nicole is gonna work behind the scenes to have this appear on your Google Classroom as well. And I am delighted to say that within the next couple of days, we'll also have a PDF of this web page produced so you can download it, save it, print it, share it with your students. Um, to help you work through the project. But I'd just like to take you through the web page now so you know what's there and you know what's coming up and you know how to proceed with this creative project. Uh, so we welcome you to the landing page for We Change the World Past Project, which is of course an AEF and NGV Collaborative Schools Partnership. You can learn a little bit more about the National Gallery of Victoria. There's also a link to our website if you'd like to explore more of our collection. Um, we then run through, yes. Um, I can't see what you're sharing. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, Thank you. Oh my gosh, sorry about that. Let's try again. Just having a nice little conversation with myself about that. Is that better? Here we go. Hey, how's that? Perfect. Oh, great. All right. Well, if you can just remember everything I said, but this time we can see the visuals over the top. We've got this landing page here that welcomes you to the project. You can learn a bit more about the National Gallery of Victoria, where I work, and you can visit our website. Our project objectives are for you to continue this conversation about the power of art and design and how it can inform change. Uh, we'd like you to contribute to a collaborative project that really gets your students thinking about what's happening in their own communities or, and the world more broadly. Um, continued relationship and connection and dialogue between Australian and Papua New Guinea partnership communities. This is something you can check in with one another and continue to talk about. And uh, we'd love to see some conversations about global and local current affairs come up between the different communities across Australia and Papua New Guinea. So you've already attended the virtual introduction um, to this project. Um, after today's session, you are invited to begin designing and creating a poster for change. We've got an online progress uh, catch up, which is coming up in two weeks time that you can check into and have a chat about your project and let us know how's, how everything is traveling. And then all of your amazing poster designs are going to be put into a virtual exhibition. Um, so the key dates, if you're wondering how long is this going to take and the timeline, we've kicked off today with our virtual project launch in two weeks time. It's not compulsory, but if you'd like to attend an informal progress catch up, drop in, bring a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, um, have a chat with us about uh, what you're doing, what issues your students are interested in, your opinions on art and design and change. Uh, then you have a little bit more time Around the 20th of April, you can submit your uh, posters for presentation and uh, we're going to put all of those posters together and present them in an online exhibition where we can come back to view them together and discuss them as a group. I might just skip past the curriculum connections. These are based on the Australian curriculum um, and you can uh, read more about how they connect to the visual arts and also how this project connects to intercultural understanding, which is always a priority when we work um, with AES. Um, next, you've got a little bit of information about how you can use the resources that I've shown you, such as the We Change the World virtual tour, how you can explore that with your students. And the other link that I've put here is the uh, exhibition page as well, where you can continue to explore the different themes, the different videos and essays. Your students might like to just explore this website a little bit. There might be a particular theme that interests them. There might be a 
designer or an artist whose work speaks to them, or you might like to choose a couple of works to focus on and have a bit of a group discussion with your class. Uh, if you do, um, you can maybe choose a work from the exhibition and we've got some guiding questions to help your students unpack those works of art and design that appear in the exhibition. And we've also got a We Change the World uh, resource for teachers and students. So um, this will help you, I guess, guide your way through the exhibition content. And there are, for example, if we click on this beautiful piece by Alexandra Kehioglu, you can read about the work, about her art practice, and then there are some questions and activities that you can do with your students as well. So like I said, it's a very big exhibition. We don't have time to go through everything today, but hopefully with these additional resources, you'll be able to learn more about the exhibition and enjoy exploring it with your students. Um, finally, we get to the poster instructions. So we've put together a little step-by-step -step resource to help you come up with ideas for your posters, uh, how you might like to refine those ideas, um, presenting your posters, coming up with the concept and actually producing um, the piece. Uh, so you are invited to um, put your students in groups. They might like to work individually. You might like to connect with your partnership school and communicate with them. It's up to you, whatever feels the right way to go about this project, um, we'll leave uh, that up to you. Um, so like I said, they can work individually, they can work in pairs or small groups. Um, produce a poster that's either A4 or A3 in size. It doesn't have to be really big. I mean, if you need to make something really big, go for it, but you know, work within your constraints and what you're able to produce. The key thing is though, the students are thinking about what is the change that they'd like to see in the world? How do they feel like they can influence change? How can their poster, their piece of design help change the world? We don't have any restrictions on the materials or the media, but we do ask that you submit your poster digitally. So that means you can either make it on a computer or if you use something like paint, pencil, watercolor, um, take a photo and submit it that way. And we've got some submission instructions down here, um, but we've got the following sort of step-by-step -step guide. This six sort of step process is one that we use quite Commonly, when we produce resources for teachers who are using the National Gallery of Victoria for their teaching and learning, going from brainstorming, selecting ideas, working out what's important to the students, refining ideas, working out which is the best one, how do you choose that, what are you the most passionate about, what imagery comes to mind, what do you feel strongly about, and so on. Um, doing your research, looking into um, how other artists and designers have focused on that. So if you've picked an environmental issue like uh, pollution in the ocean, for example, what other images are already out there? How have other artists or designers approached this? What uh, colours, what words, what, what ideas are associated with that and how can that help influence your design? When you've got some idea of what you'd like to do, you can create a draft. This is probably where you might like to be in about two weeks time. So when you've got some ideas, you've done some brainstorming, you've done a sketch of what you'd like to do, feel free to you know, check in um, during the progress, catch up online, uh, share what you're doing, get some feedback, um, especially if you're at the point where we're like, oh, we're nearly ready to make our final presentation, but we have these two great ideas and I don't know which one to choose. You can share them with us. Uh, and then once you've got your idea, create your phone uh, poster. Um, I've got some added ideas for how big it should be. Again, a reminder that the materials are up to you and just remember to submit that poster digitally. And the final step in the process is sending it off to this email address with a couple of reflection questions. So this will help inform the discussion that we have when we view the exhibition together, asking the students what idea they chose to represent and how they've expressed their feelings towards it. If they think their design is you know, effective, 
um, and how they think that their poster might impact those who view it and inspire change. So really reminding students that they have agency, they have a voice, and they can express how they feel about the world and make a positive influence. When we've got all those submissions together, we'll have our virtual exhibition. And I'll just go back up to the top. We've scheduled that for Tuesday, the 3rd of May. I imagine it will be around this time. I'm sure Nicole will keep you up to date on the Google Classroom, but we'd love to see you there having a look at your amazing posters um, on display in a virtual exhibition, your own We Change the World poster exhibition. Uh, so what I might do here, I might uh, end the screen share and just check in to see if anybody has uh, any questions about the project or any comments about the launch today. If there's anything that I can help you with before we go, please let me know. Yes, thank you so much. Your comments, questions, the conversations we were having were fabulous. So I feel very inspired. Uh, I'm off to make a positive change in the world now. And I hope you all are as well. All the best as you embark on the project with your students. Thank you, Nicole, Sophie, Aaron, uh, working behind the scenes uh, there as well. Sophie, Nicole, it's been great to work with you. And yeah, once again, Loretta, big thanks to your team from me as well. Thank you, everybody.